Good, Good evening. evening and welcome. We're going to be standing. Good evening. Good evening. We're standing for Sister Sylvia. She's not able to uh, make it this evening. So we'll begin with a word of prayer. Amen. Our Lord, Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening thankful for life, thankful for the blessings. We pray that you be with Brother Mahasra as he brings to us the word. We pray for that you hasten those who are on their way and also pray for the presence of thy Holy Spirit to lead and guide in everything. Be with us this day and thank you for the, the blessings. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 I'm going to start off with a song called, Oh What a Saviour.
find me. What a saviour. We certainly need Jesus in our lives because he's the only one that can save us. So welcome Amen. again and welcome uh, Brother Mahasa. The time is the time yours. Is yours. Um, we're looking forward to the message for this evening. Welcome. Amen. Uh, thank you the Tuckley Twins. Uh, a songs full of me I mean full of uh, a message uh, of redemption and of hope and ultimately the hope that we have in Jesus when he comes back to take us home when we will spend eternity with him thank you and God bless you for your ministry and I want to I want to welcome every one of us every one of you who has who is joining and those who will be jo who are joining are welcome and uh, uh my the lord bless you and me tonight as we continue to look into uh, the wonderful theme of uh, the nature of the son of god uh, when he came on earth uh, we are continuing continuing in our series um, with a theme question uh, reading, how could a misunderstanding, how can you and me misunderstand the human nature of Christ when he came on earth? How can that misunderstanding or how can uh, uh, the decision or the right concept that you can hold what nature he had when he came on earth. How can that affect your soul salvation? And even that, how can it now affect you when you get it right? As we have seen, he came uh, in sinful uh, flesh, uh, which is the same uh, that we have, that me and you have. It's the same flesh uh, that all those who lived after sin entered the world, after Adam, Adam's fall, that's the same sinful flesh uh, uh, that we all possess. And Jesus Christ came after that time period. It, we have seen throughout the scriptures that it has a lot of meaning and it is pivotal uh, to the doctrine uh, that we hold about our salvation and even more so the gospel itself. So welcome once again. Uh, let's uh, pray so that uh, we can invite the presence of God in our midst. Uh, let us pray, saints. Thank you, Father. Thank you, good God. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your long suffering again towards us. You have seen it fit that we should be still be alive at uh, this moment at uh, this hour, this second, uh, maybe uh, we are the one who need you most. We are the ones who have not made things right with you and you've preserved our lives. You've given us chance after chance. Even now you're giving us a chance uh, that we can make things right with you. You are in need of us being saved. So please, Father, uh, bless us with thy presence. Let the spirit that is yours, even the Holy Spirit, guide and endow uh, us with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, especially me, as I lead uh, your servants in this study about uh, your nature. Thank you, Father. Forgive us all our sins and where we have gone wrong, where we have done things that are not like you, Father that even this, our assembly, may not be an abomination. More so, this is my prayer and my request may not be an abomination, O oh Lord. Uh, direct this prayer to the most holy place where our high priest, Jesus Christ, is. 
Father, please receive this our request in Jesus' mighty name. We pray. Amen. 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 Um, saints, if we can open our books, our Bibles, uh, in the book of uh, Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 15. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, of verse 15. We are continuing with our study. Uh, central to that study is the human nature of Jesus Christ. He is fully God and he is fully human, even right now, where he is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it reads, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. That verse there is loaded, is taken now straight to uh, the sanctuary uh, language. There is a high priest. Of course, we know what the high priest is doing right now in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And it is telling us that he feels it. Uh, he knows uh, our feeling. He knows our infirmity. He knows where we struggle because he will always be part of us. He will always be human like you and me because he was, he says in all points, he, wanted, he went through the test. He was tempted like as we are. And yet, he remained with no sin. He did not sin. We saw yesterday that he is our pattern, our pattern, and we're supposed to walk like he walked. It was he is like he came to show us the path, a righteous path. And he is saying, he is pointing, he is pointing back what he is saying. Just look at my life and walk and just uh, like I like I walk. Hopefully you understand that. I mean uh, that analogy. That is what that was the statement. He doesn't need to show face physically. Uh, by faith we are to follow him. Like the verse continues on to say, if I can read also verse sixteen of the same uh, chapter that we have read, the book of Hebrews. It says, "Yeah, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need." The invitation is open, but we have to understand for ourselves uh, the deep things of God. We are to search, not be surface readers. We are to know for ourselves what do these things mean. If the statement is written down in the scriptures, we are to dig deep. If we cannot understand it, we are to borrow from uh, another chapter another book another verse and bring all this evidence together and see what uh <clears throat> these words of life are trying to tell us let's also open quickly uh in the book of jeremiah if somebody can get us uh jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16 jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16 any one of us please jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16 While you're looking for Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, straight away read it for us if you find it, so that we, I know, we know that we are together. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye yes. in the ways, and see and ask for the old paths, where, it, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your soul. But they said, we will not therein. Amen. You see, we have been asked to stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. What are the old paths? I like to go back into uh, the history of uh, this church, even the Seventh-day Adventist church, the history of this faith, and see 
what were the first seven day Adventists? We know as we see them uh, in Revelation chapter 10, what was handed down to them? What did they believe? We find that they were very studious. Uh, they read a lot. The spirit of God was with them. They wrote a lot. And uh, uh, after that verse, I mean, the chapter finishes, it says that thou must prophesy again. He has a, as we saw earlier, uh, early in the week, I have this book here. It is written uh, uh, by a servant of God called Ralph Blasson. It says, 100 years of Seventh-day Adventist Christology from 1852 to 1952. Uh, the main book says the word was made flesh. The word was made flesh. Here in this book is compiled over a thousand statements uh, that say that uh, Jesus came around uh, the theme that we have been dealing with uh, this week. It is compiling all those statements that different uh, writers or different uh, um, members of denominations, uh, denom I mean, of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination wrote uh, concerning uh, Jesus Christ. Here I have A.T. Jones, and mainly today we're going to look in the sermon of W.W. Uh, w. Prescott uh, that he uh, preached somewhere in 18, uh, somewhere in 1859, I think. So, and that's our verse there, uh, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Well, we are looking at that also, I'll ask somebody to get us Psalms chapter 11, verse 3 to 5. Psalms chapter 11, verse 3 to 5. If we can find that one quickly, please, and read it. You can read it loud for each and every one of us so that we can hear for ourselves. Psalms 11, chapter 3 to 5. Anyone, please. Psalms 11, 3 to 5. Yes, And please. it says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Amen. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. And verses 5, the Lord trieth the righteous. But the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Amen. Amen. Amen, my sister. We're going there to the foundations. So to the foundations. Yes, the scriptures are our foundations. They lived longer than even uh, the pioneers. We all can go back with this theme all the way back to the first verse of the book. Or, I mean, of this book the Bible. But we want to start from uh, what the Adventists believe. E.T. Jones, in uh, 1895, uh, he wrote, the Lord Jesus entered upon the field in contest with Satan in human flesh at the point which human flesh had reached in degeneracy at the moment when he was born into the world. There, in the weakness of human nature, as it was in the world, when he came into the, into the flesh, he fought the battle. He continues on to say, human nature will never be any weaker. The world will never be any worse in itself. Human nature will never reach any lower condition in itself that it had reached when Jesus Christ came into the saints. Digest that statement, yes. He came when we were we were at our lowest. So we can he wrote this in the general conference bulletin in that year, 1895. He continued to write, to write, Jesus Christ came into the world in the weakest stage of human flesh. And in the flesh, as a man, he fought the battle with Satan. Hallelujah. Now, when this second Adam, the word that the second Adam, the second Adam you know, was fallen. When the second Adam comes into human flesh, right at the point to which Satan had brought the whole, the whole race by sin, 
And there in all this weakness enters upon contest, Satan can never say that that is not fair. See how the, God, the Godhead works? It waited, yes, until we were at our weakest point. But even it was targeting that Satan should not complain. Oh, no, no, it is not fair. You have come when they are still, you know, the first humans were strong in the faith. He did not come in the days of Noah, in the days of in, Enos, Enoch, in the days of Methuselah, or even Adam himself. No, he comes at a time when we were at our weakest, after 4,000 years of sin. Yes, so he cannot do it. So Satan cannot say it's not fair. For there stood Christ in the very weakness of the flesh to which Satan had brought man. Christ came in the very weakness which Satan had brought upon the press. There's a lot of uh, statements there. That's A.T. Jones. We have statements from uh, people like J.H. Starbuck, J.H. Darland, a lot of them. But today uh, we are going to look at uh, this sermon here now. One of uh, our older members, W.W. W. Prescott, uh, wrote in October 31, 1895. He said it was a Sunday evening. Prescott preached a sermon at the Armadale Camp Meeting in Victoria, Australia. I was during a camp meeting. So here now, Ellen White looks like she was in attendance. I like to dig into history as we have read those verses in Jeremiah 6. I mean, 16 Psalms 11 is so telling us, go back, check, check. These things are recorded for us. Why not? We should check and see uh, what was written down, what is recorded and kept. This is our inheritance now to an extent. This uh, is what we can look at to and, and to and refer and check if we are still uh, on the boat. It says, Ellen White had this sermon and his other sermons, the sermons of W.W. W. Prescott, and his other sermons that followed it, and was so moved that she expressed her gratitude for this message in fervent terms in several different letters to various people. So she had the sermon and she was excited about the sermon and as she wrote it, she mentioned it in very many letters to the people she communicated with. We we'll continue to read. Uh, I have just been listening, one of the letters, listening to a discourse given by Professor Prescott. It was a most powerful appeal to the people. Maggie here is reporting, Professor Prescott discusses and my topics for publication. His sermons will never seem the same. Listen, saints, catch this. His sermons will never seem the same. I fear as when given by the lead, they will never be the same that she fears as they were given by the living preacher. Why? For the words are spoken in the demonstration of the spirit and with power. When he was speaking, his face all aglow with the sunshine of heaven. The presence of the Lord is in our meetings day by day. So when this brother Prescott was speaking, he says, yeah, the presence of the Lord was, in, was with him. He had a certain glow here uh, uh, that uh, indicated that the word, he says, yeah, the Lord had, she continues to write, the Lord has visited Prescott, Prescott in a special manner and given him a special message for the people. And that's the message to an extent that we've been looking into this week. The truth flows forth from him in rich currents. People say the Bible is now a new revelation to them. So the people who are listening, they were now uh, putting uh, these pieces together, the truth that, I mean, the way he was bringing out uh, what he was teaching, he was talking about the nature of Jesus Christ and how he came down to save fallen man. People, we were now putting the picture together and appreciating the sacrifice that was done for them on the cross. He says here, those who since the Minneapolis meeting have had the privilege of listening to the word spoken 
by the messengers of God. And I had a meeting there. We see there was A.T. Jones also and E.J. Wagner and also W.W. Pesco. They were preaching that message also of righteousness by faith. It says, yeah, heaven's light has been shining. The trumpet has given a certain sound. Light has been shining upon justification by faith and the imputed righteousness of Christ. The Lord has sent Prescott. This is E.G. White saying, the Lord has sent Prescott. He is no empty vessel, but full of heavenly pleasure. He has presented truths in clear and simple style, rich in nourishment. W.W. W. Prescott has been bearing the burning words of truth, such as I have heard from Psalm in 1844. The inspiration of the Holy Spirit is upon him. Prescott has never had such power in preaching the truth. Prescott has had outpouring of Holy Spirit since coming here. We distinguish voice of the true shepherd. We distinguish voice over true shepherd. The truth poured forth from his lips as people never, the truth poured forth from his lips, she writes, as people never had it before. People say that that man is inspired. We are not worshiping the man saying, sorry, that's not what we are doing. We are just looking at what was written down uh, 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 for our record in that time period. The people wanted printed copies. It says here, yeah. Prescott has spoken many times at the Armandale camp meeting. They were in a camp meeting, as we have seen, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is the servant of the Lord, right? It is, she says, the people wanted printed copies of Prescott's messages. They acted like a flock of half-starved fish. Are we starving today? And isn't this what we do when we are evangelists that are full of the spirit that's sent to us and we go to listen to them in all whatever camp meetings that we have we are looking for the books we are looking for their cities and this is what was happening here today they are begging for a copy of these messages that the brother was preaching they want to read and study every point presented yes here egw endorsed uh, this brother uh someone uh, we shall leave it at that. I mean, she wrote a lot about uh, 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 what she had during that camp meeting, but uh, part of what she had was uh, uh, Brother Prescott. He shared things, uh, for, I mean, uh, mainly on the subject of that uh, the word became flesh, and we know that word is Jesus Christ himself. Uh, we saw here uh, a helpful truth. He, he wrote about, I mean, on that someone he talked about Adam's sin, typical, it talks about also unto us, a son is given. He has borne our griefs, a reunited family in the kingdom of God, our representative in the courts of heaven. Christ identified with us, unity in Christ, the heart and life of Christianity. This is what he wrote about the heart and the life of Christianity. This is what we have been looking at this week here. Let's look at it here. It says, he wrote something like this. In, in his sermon, sorry, this is what he preached about. In his sermon, he said this, let us enter into the experience that God has given Jesus Christ to us to dwell in our sinful flesh, to work out in our sinful flesh what he worked out when he was here. He came and lived here that we may through him reflect the image of God. So Jesus Christ came and lived among us, among us, uh, you and me, see, live in his presence through the Holy Spirit so that me and you can reflect the image of God. He continues to say, this is the very heart of Christianity the understanding of the incarnation of the Son of God is the very heart of Christianity. Anything contrary to it is not Christianity. We saw yesterday that if you deny the Son, you deny the Father. If you deny, if you do not understand that he came in sinful flesh, then you've got it wrong concerning 
your salvation and my salvation. He says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets, we saw that yesterday, are gone into the world here by no ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. We saw that John 1, 1 John 4, 1 to 3. Now that cannot mean simply to acknowledge that Jesus Christ was here and lived in the flesh. Mm? He's saying that cannot only simply acknowledge that, that Jesus was among us, was on earth, walked this earth and lived in the flesh. Because why? The devils made the acknowledgement. They knew that Christ had come in flesh. The faith that comes by the Spirit of God says, Jesus Christ is come in my flesh. I have received him. That is the heart and the life of Christianity. So here we have been reminded that the faith, this is what brother was preaching at that particular time, at that camp meeting, is saying that your understanding, uh, the people who were present at that time, and even today as ourselves, our understanding of Jesus coming in your sinful flesh, in my sinful flesh, and that you and me have received him, you receive him in that sense, he is calling that that is the heart and life of Christianity. The difficulty with the Christianity of today is that Christ does not dwell in the hearts of the professing, of those professing his name. So it goes deeper. That's why we're saying we go to dig deeper. This is the science of redemption. Uh, this is true heart religion. While you profess Christianity, while you profess to know him, we have been told that the heart of being Christian is the believing that Jesus came in your flesh and he lived a sinless life and overcame sin, the incarnation of the Son of God understanding that and embracing it is the heart and life of Christianity. And it's telling us Christians of today, we give lip service. We have not manifested. We have not allowed Christ to live in our hearts. If he is in our heart, if he is alive in us, we wouldn't be involved uh, with sin. We wouldn't be struggling as we struggle uh, spiritually. But yeah, let's leave that for now. It says here now, it continues to say, he is an outsider, one looked at from afar as an example. But he is more than an example to us. He made known to us that God's, God's ideal of you, he made known to us what God's ideal of humanity is the idea of Jesus coming to us. What was that idea in the first place? It is Christ, the Son of God, the majesty of heaven, to live, to be alive in you. His life, his character, be manifest in yours and mine, a life. And then he came and lived in, lived it out before us. He came and showed us, showed us an example that we may see what it is to be in the image of God. He said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He lived that life so that we can now also, the image of God can be reflected in us. It's the message of the third angel, the message of uh, manifestation of the knowledge of God through our lives. This is what it is. This is the gospel itself. Then he died and ascended to his father, sending forth his spirit, his own representative to live in us, that the life which he lived in the flesh, we may live over again. This is Christianity. 
He said, that is what it means, that the heart and the life of Christianity is Christ, the fullness of the God had bodily to be alive in us. There can never be sin. Uh, I mean, um, we can never be convinced of sin if this is the case. It is calling us, literally, as we saw yesterday, for victory over sin. He went on to write, he says, Christ must dwell. No, he went on to preach. Christ must dwell in the heart. It is not enough to talk of Christ and of the beauty of his character. Christianity without, without Christ dwelling in the heart is not genuine Christianity. He only is a genuine Christian who has Christ dwelling in his heart. And we can live the life of Christ only by having him dwelling in us. He wants us to lay hold upon the life and the power of Christianity. You see, this is the life and the power of Christianity. We saw and understood, you said, all the Old Testament prophecy, I mean, the uh, prophecies and even the sanctuary service itself, uh, that lamb or that blood that was shed in the sanctuary, all that was pointing uh, to Christ. We saw that Judaism and uh, Christianity, the relationship they have is that Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism there. It continues to say here that do not be, I mean, sorry, Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism and central to all that, central to all that, uh, uh, those concepts there is Jesus Christ himself. They look forward to the cross. But we look back uh, to the cross because we are living after the time Christ uh, shed his blood on that cross for you and for me. So says, do not be satisfied with anything else. This is after we have understood and agreed that he wants us to lay hold upon the life and power of Christianity. And he goes on to say, do not be satisfied with anything else. Heed no one who would lead you in any other path. Christ in you, the hope of glory, is power, his indwelling presence. That is Christianity. As we saw in Colossians chapter 1, verse I think 26 and 27 there, saying that Christ in you, the hope of glory, his power to transform your life and my life, his indwelling presence. Yes, that is Christianity. That is what we need today. And I am thankful that there are hearts that are longing for that or for this experience. And who will recognize it when it comes? So when this experience, when we are longing is that we're waiting for the outpouring of the spirit. We are making our soul temples ready for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Fourth angel now joins that third angel uh, of Revelation chapter 14, righteousness by faith, that outpouring of the spirit. Yes, if we are longing for that experience, yes, we will recognize it when it comes. It like it will be falling on our brothers and sisters all over our congregations and our communities of uh, uh, Seventh day Adventists, and we will be able to know it and to identify that that brother is full of the Holy Spirit. It will be powerful, even more powerful uh, than what happened uh, in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. This is what we are talking about here. It says here, yeah, I am I am, it says, I am thankful that there are hearts that are longing for that experience and who will recognize it 
when it comes. They will know. They will see. It, it does not make any difference what your name or denomination has been. Recognize Jesus and let him dwell in you. Lots of people at the time will be converted to that message. The message of righteousness by faith. It goes to the whole world. It is not only uh, for a seven-day Adventist. It will be targeting every human being, everyone, because all Jesus died for all of us. I tell you, this is a wondrous, mm, a wondrous truth. It says, sorry, let's go back a little bit. It says, I recognize Jesus Christ and let him dwell in you. By following where he leads, we shall know that Christian experience, what Christian experience is and what it is to dwell in the light of his presence. We read there, we should come boldly to the throne of grace. I tell you, this is a wondrous truth. Human language cannot put more into human thought or language than is said in these words. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is our salvation. The object in these remarks is not merely to establish a line of thought. No, it is not just to establish a a line of thought or to just remain, leave it at the, theological terms or something that we just say and we are happy to, to just say. No, it is saying to us, it is to bring new life into our soul and open our ideas of the word of God and the gift of God that we may be able to grasp his love for us we need it. Nothing short of that will meet what we have to meet. The world, flesh, and the devil. But he that is for us is mightier than mightier than he that is against us. Let us have in our daily lives Jesus Christ, the word that became flesh. He's telling us here, Mm. nothing short of what will meet what we have to meet the world, the flesh and the, that's what we are facing here but we are being encouraged uh, that uh, he that is in us is mightier uh, than him that is against us, we know the fall, uh, that dangerous fall that is against us but Jesus Christ has already conquered. So we have got to take encouragement from uh, the saving work of our master, even Christ Jesus, when he was on earth. He lived that life, an example for us, so that we can follow after his footsteps here. This is, uh, this is what he preached. Uh, we, are, we are looking or we are going through uh, the sermon of uh, W.W. Uh, Prescott uh, on that uh, day in the camp meeting in 1895 and what he talked about when he was preaching to those who were present. So he talked uh, about uh, the word which became flesh. He says, as we know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. We know that as in a in you know, John chapter 1, and the word was with God, and the word was God. We know this word here to be uh, Jesus Christ, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh. The theme of redemption will be the science that and the song of the eternal ages. We saw that yesterday, even angels desire to look into this theme and we it is telling us the theme of redemption will be this is the science of sciences if there is a word like that but it is telling us the theme of redemption will be the science and the song of the eternal ages 
we shall be looking into this subject for ceaseless, ceaseless ages, and we shall not come to the bottom or to that. It will not end. There is still a lot that we, we will have to understand how God can come into the sinful world and be born like a baby, like a baby and grow amongst us, take our form. What manner of love is, love is that? How can divinity combine with humanity in fallen state? But that happened. So this is what it is talking about. And well, it, it goes on to tell us that it, it may, and well may it occupy our minds during our short stay here. The science of redemption, we have been encouraged that let it occupy our minds during our short stay on this planet. There is no portion of this great thing that makes such a demand on our minds in order to appreciate it in any degree as the subject we shall study tonight. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through him all things beca became. Now he himself became. We're taking, we're taking back to the creation uh, language there. As we've seen in uh, the first chapter of the book of John. We, un we understand the nothing that was made. Uh, without him, there was nothing that was made. Now him who was the greatest, it, we are being told here, he also became. How did he become? At his incarnation, when he became man like you and me, when he was born of a woman in this world of ours. He who had all glory with the Father now lays aside his glory and became flesh. He lays aside his divine mode of existence and takes the human mode of existence and God becomes manifest in the flesh. This truth is the very foundation of all truth. That is the only line that I was looking for to share in this piece here where he talked about the word became flesh because we throughout the week, I think we must have uh, uh, used this analogy of John uh, chapter one where the word became flesh, but we are being told here by W. W. Prescott in his, uh, in his uh, sermon that the understanding of the word became flesh, that this is truth. This truth, that this truth of understanding how the word became flesh, that this truth is the very foundation of all truth. Where? Ever we look at in the scriptures, be understanding even the prophecies, the gospel itself, whatever it is, it is centered at this truth that the word became flesh. Jesus Christ became like you and me. Why did heaven give? A risk. I don't. I don't know if I can use that word risk. But why did heaven invest so heavily in you and me? We are being told if we understand the answer, and we know the answer. Why it is? Be, we are being told here that this is the very foundation of all truth. Yours, for, I mean, salvation and my salvation. And Jesus showed us that uh, example, a helpful truth. And Jesus Christ becoming flesh, God being manifest in the flesh is one of the most helpful truths, one of the most instructive truths with you, which humanity ought to rejoice. The elder here, the professor here, Prescott, uh, encourages that we should rejoice in this truth. And why not? Yes, amongst in a, a hundred, uh, the parable is told by Jesus, 
that he went to look for that one sheep that was lost. He, uh, among, among his hundred, uh, one walks off and the shepherd, the true shepherd, follows uh, that one sheep to find it uh, wherever uh, it uh, uh, wandered to. We are that one sheep. Um, in the whole universe, every every other planet, every other uh, planet, and uh, what well, the intelligences of in the, in those worlds, they are okay. They are not contaminated with sin, but we have to understand why he could not just ignore us, but he sent his only begotten son to come to this sewer of sin. So you and me can have another chance uh, to commune with our father face to face, physical. And we can now also be uh, granted uh, that entry into the very presence of the father. For that was the plan in the first place. He said, for 4,000 years, this went on. We're talking under the, I mean, the subject of Adam's sin typical. For 4,000 years, as we saw, this went on, I mean, the issue of sin in our planet. And then Jesus Christ came of flesh and in the flesh, born of a woman, made under the law, born of the spirit, but in the flesh. As we see, it's taken from Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, where he says that, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, born. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the woman there being uh, one like me, uh, like you and me, she, Mary, was uh, with sinful flesh. She was a sinner like you and me. And through that birth forever, uh, Jesus has remained one of us. He's got flesh of like yours and uh, mine. He will be forever our brother. He will be forever human and forever God. He says here, born of the spirit, but in the flesh. And what flesh could he take but the flesh of that time? Not only that, but it was the flesh, the better flesh he designed to take. Because you see, the problem was to help man out of the difficulty into which he had fallen. And man is a free moral agent. He must be helped as a free moral agent. Yes, Christ's work must be not to destroy him, not to create a new race. He would have done that, but no, he is sought to reach out, but to recreate his mission. The mission of heaven is to recreate man, to restore in him that image of God. Filthy man, as we know, can be restored into the image of God. This is the plan of redemption. This is the mission uh, that heaven embarked on when it sent forth his son in the fullness of time. When he was born of a woman under the law, it was to recreate man. We see that also after he did his work of redemption, he rested, hallelujah, on that Sabbath day. After he had said, it is finished. He recognized that recreation by resting in the tomb. And on the first day of the week, after resting, to recognize the Sabbath, the angels of God were sent. They did not waste no time. They said, they knocked and they said, your father calls you after he had finished what we have just looked at, the recreation of man, making the Sabbath also the re memorial of redemption. We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of the crowned with glory and honor that he by grace of God should test death for every man. We saw that also yesterday in Hebrews 2, 9. He had to test death uh, for you and um, me. So that we, these things, the theme of understanding who Christ is, we can, well, as, we, as we have read, 
that we shall be looking into this subject for ceaseless ages. So we should not mind if maybe I may sound repetitive uh, during, I mean, uh, the course of this week. We are told here that in this little time that we have on earth, it is look, heaven looks at it as little time. We should dwell in this subject because when we will finally get there, this will be the subject. We will not be talking about the mark of the beast, uh, the man of sin, whoever, and everything else. No, this will be the subject. Redemption. How? How? What manner of love that we have been shown? Jesus lives in heaven. Jesus lives in the majesty. I mean, uh, the presence of the Father to come and live a life like he lived just because of you and me. This will be the subject. Here. Yeah. Let's uh, look at this witness here. We know we're running out of time, but I don't, I don't know if you can bear with me. Uh, let's uh, get this out of the way quickly here. There is a lot in, in this sermon that W.W. W. Prescott shared, I mean, preached on that day. But here is, uh, let us look at some, uh, uh, what says here, an undone, helpless race. It's taken from uh, uh, that experience that Jacob had when he was running, I mean, running from his brother after he, has, he had taken his birthright. God made man a little lower than the angels. We saw that in Hebrews chapter 2. Now, uh, a little lower than the angels, but man fell much lower by his sin. We are told that, of course, and it is evident. We fell much lower. We were lower. Uh, I don't know now what we can say that we are in a worse of place. I don't know, but we have seen earlier that Jesus came at the right time. There, We cannot even get, I mean, at the time that he came, a man cannot be at their lowest point than the time Jesus came and died on the cross. He says, yeah, now he is far separated from God. Me and you are far separated from God, but he is to be brought back again. Man is, be, is to be brought back again from uh, this uh, fall here. Jesus Christ came for the, that work to bring back man from where he had fallen. And in order to do it, he came not where a man was before he fell, we have to catch that. That is the theme of uh, our study this week. Not before, but after the fall, but where a man was after he fell. This is when Jesus comes in. The rescue mission is after the fall. This is the lesson of Jacob's ladder. It rested on earth, where Jacob was in his dream, he sees that ladder all the way from heaven to where he was. But the topmost round reached to heaven. When Christ comes to help man out of the pit, saints catch this, Christ coming from heaven, the earth where me and you are is the pit. Picture the ladder. He does not come to the edge of the pit and look over. No, he is not going to stay in the borders of heaven and look over and look down and say, come up here. No. And I will help you back. He's not going to say, come up here and I will help you back. No. If man could help himself up to the point from whence he has fallen, he could do all the rest. You see now? If he can help himself even one step, so man can help himself of the rest of uh, climbing the, the ladder. No, it says here, yeah, if he could help himself one step, he could help himself all the way. And those, that's not the idea. But it is become man is utterly ruined, weak and wounded and broken to pieces. Look at Jacob running from the brother, worried broken to pieces, I mean, tired. That is the analogy here of man. He is wounded and broken to pieces. In fact, perfectly helpless. 
that Jesus Christ comes right down where he is and meets him there. So Jesus Christ comes, he came in the dream. Yes, we see wrestling with Jacob. And Jacob, after he understood who uh, was wrestling with him, he could not let go. But daybreak was coming and he said, please, Jesus is saying that, uh, let me go. But Jacob is saying, no, I will not let you go until you bless me. Uh, that should be our experience here. But the more of the story here and the lesson is that Jesus Christ comes right down where we are. And that's what happened. He came right where uh, we are in our, I mean, uh, our most, at our lowest. That's where uh, Jesus, heaven sought uh, Jesus to come. He takes his flesh and becomes a brother to him. Jesus Christ is a brother to us in the flesh. He was born into the family for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He had only God, had only one son, and he gave him away. And to whom did he give him? Unto us, a child is born. We are told he gave him to us. Then we are told, we understand it. We remember as in Isaiah 9, 6, unto us a son is given. But what was the mission of this son? Sin has made a change even in heaven. For Jesus Christ, because of sin, has taken upon himself humanity. And today he wears that humanity and will throw all eternity. Imagine that. Try to compute that in your mind. And let me try to compute it in my mind. He will always be like you and me. He will always be human uh, like we are. Uh, Jesus Christ became the son of man as well the son of God. That's where we see in the scriptures it's called son of man because that's what he became. As we see there, he was born of a woman. He was born of Mary. He was born into our family. He did not come as an angelic being. We have seen that, but was born into the family and grew up in it. He was a child, a youth, a young man, a man in the full prime of life, in our family, he is the son of man, related to us, bearing the flesh that we bear. Saints, there is a lot that can be said, and we can open the scriptures and uh, read uh, to see for ourselves uh, what uh, this means to us, that the world the word, the word, that word being Jesus Christ was made flesh. And uh, that for over uh, in a hundred years, that was our central theme. The understanding of that context there, uh, that wording, uh, that truth was central to our teaching. And Amen. It is central to our teaching today. It will never change that Jesus Christ became flesh like us. But as we shall see maybe tomorrow and the next day, uh, that when we try to mix this up, when we try to word it in uh, confusing uh, languages and long sentences, uh, then we lose uh, this golden chain uh, that... Uh, was brought down to us as we have seen that for example the ladder of jacob there we lose that connection with heaven so the correct understanding uh, must be central uh, to our teaching of the gospel even the everlasting gospel or even the understanding uh, that jesus came to save you and me that should be central um to all our understanding of this truth. Saints, I uh, pray uh, that uh, you got uh, the, I mean, the lesson 
and the message and that uh, you were blessed. As I was preparing, I was blessed. A lot of these things I do not know myself, but the more I look into it, the more my mind is open. All that I pray is that God can now uh, endow me with knowledge, wisdom, and tact, and how I can share uh, things like this. For we have seen this uh, was uh, uh, central uh, to those who were first uh, Seventh-day Adventists. They liked to look at uh, the word of God, to dig deeper and to find those gems and to uh, put them in the larger picture of the plan of redemption, what it means ultimately uh, for our salvation. And they got it. So today we cannot come to a point where we start to mix up this thing. While we are saying one thing, we are meaning something else, distorting the truth. But we should remain uh, in the world. We should check everything, everything that we have said here, that I have said here. We feel like brains. Go back and check if it is so. God bless you and uh, have a blessed night. Uh, let us pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy, O oh Lord. We again appreciate for uh, the long suffering uh, uh, that you have shown unto us and that you have sent uh, your son in, in this world. That is history now, but it continues through thy spirit. We are looking at the coming back of your son again in the clouds of heaven to take us home. But he left us a pattern. He left us an example. And the encouragement is that we should follow or walk in it. That he did not, he has not left us on our own self, on our own devices, or our own understanding or knowledge. The spirit and all the heavenly intelligences of God, that God is available for us to help us in this heavenward journey. Bless us tonight, oh God. Bless all families and individuals uh, uh, that are congregated here tonight, oh God. And even we pray for those who are not here. We pray even for all your people and even those who will believe on this message and understand the central and core point of all truth uh, and that is found, found is foundation is found in that word being made flesh in Jesus being uh, trans I mean uh, born in a flesh like one that we have today so thank you father we pray that you forgive us of all our sins and everything that we have done that is abominable to you and is like not you, oh Father. Forgive us, Father. We ask and pray and send this request to the most holy place where our master, even Jesus Christ, is. Please receive this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. We pray. Amen. 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 What a message. Amen. So deep, you know, we, Jesus lived the life and we need to reflect his image. And um, it's true that we can do nothing without Jesus. We need, we need, his, we need him in our lives because he came, he came from heaven down to earth to save us on the cross. And, um, there's so much, there's so much um, in this message that you know you can't digest it all at once. It's so, so such a deep message, and thank you for the message. Yeah. Um, I'm going to finish with a song called "He Is the Light."
Yes, what we need to do is to reflect Christ's character. And he's, he's done so much for us. And thank you once again for the message. Um, Amen. Sister Anne-Marie, can you pray, please, to close the meeting? Okay, let us pray. Gracious and merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for all your grace. We thank you for your tender mercies towards us, your little children. Father, we come in the name of Jesus Christ, asking you to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we just want to thank you for the message that was spoken by Brother Martin. I pray, dear Lord, that you will fill him with your Holy Spirit, that you will give him, put your words in his mouth, in his tongue, in his heart, in his, in his mind, that he will speak for you. And Father, as we go to bed, I pray that you will give us a good night's sleep, that we will be refreshed and revitalized to give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you for the prayer, Sister Anne Marie, and thank you again for the timely message. Feel full of the Holy Spirit. You can tell when people have the Holy Spirit when they when they preach, and this message tonight certainly was filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. To God be um, the glory. To tomorrow morning at uh, four forty-five, it will be morning prayers, and then at five thirty, it will be Desire of Ages. Then 12 o'clock midday prayers, and then at 6.30 song service, followed by another timely message from, uh, from Brother Mahasa. So now we, we were looking forward to that. So that's tomorrow's programmes. And there's also the prayer retreat, which starts on the 20th of December to the 26th. All roads lead to Kef and Lee. So book your, your, um, your, your forms, get your forms ready and, and book your place so we, you, you don't miss the blessings. So that's all for tonight and thank you and uh, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>